Well, I trust that you really enjoyed that. I want you to really sit back and I've got a very serious message I want to share with you today. Something that God has put on my heart early today and I really need to share this with you because we are getting so many comments on this very issue in the office. I want to talk to you about unforgiveness. That's right. And I can see some of you sitting up already. Angus, don't go there. Don't start that. I'm never going to forgive him. I'm never going to forgive her. I'm never going to get rid of that company that has hurt me so badly. I want to tell you today, you need to forgive. Why? Because God said so. You know, I looked up the Oxford Dictionary to find out the literal meaning of the word unforgiveness. What it means is not willing to forgive or excuse faults. That's what it means. Now, if we go to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 6 and verse 12. Now, remember, Matthew chapter 6, starting from verse 9, is where Jesus taught you and I how to pray. And I'll read it out of the New King James Version. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Now listen for it, verse 12. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Another version says the wrongs which we have done, Lord, forgive us as we also forgive those who have wronged us. We have got to deal right now, today on this revival train, with unforgiveness. If we don't, it becomes like a cancer. It starts small and then it starts to explode in your body until eventually it destroys you. It's like rust in a motor car. I've got a very good friend who's got a huge uh, panel beating business. And he will tell you that you can't just cover over rust. You can't put body filler on the rust and then paint over it and hope it'll go away. No, it continues to eat the steel. What you do, you take a cutting torch and you cut that piece of rust out. And then you get another piece of, of uh, iron and you weld it on to that hole and then you spray paint it. That is how you deal with rust. We need to cut it out completely. You cannot continue to have unforgiveness in your heart and expect to have a life full of success and joy and peace. Okay, you've got to get it out of your system. And I can hear some of you saying, but Angus, we can't. I can't. I can't do it. You have to. Jesus said you have to. Not for his sake, but because he loves you and for your sake. You've got to. It's like somebody says, I can't stop drinking. You can, you just don't want to. Somebody says, I can't stop taking drugs. You can, you just don't want to. You've got to make a decision today. You've got to draw a line in the sand and say this far devil and no further. We've got to do it for our own sake so that God can bless us. How can you take a splinter out of your brother's eye when you've got a log or a plank in your own eye? You can't, can you? Well, that, you'll find that in Luke chapter 6 and verse 41. The Lord says, first, take the plank, the log out of your own eye, and then you'll be able to help someone else. When you've got unforgiveness in your heart, you can't minister to anybody else. You know, before I get up in the morning, I've got to confess all of my sins before the Lord 
so that I, I can't stand here today and speak to you in all earnestness if I have unforgiveness in my heart towards anyone. We've got to deal with it. If you say, I can't, you can. What you might have to do today, and I'm going to pray for you at the end of the program, you might have to take that unforgiveness and give it to God and then move on. And you'll find one day you'll wake up and it's gone. Okay, the devil is the instigator. You see, he wants to keep you in chains. He wants to keep that 50 kg bag of cement on your back. He wants to break you down through unforgiveness because unforgiveness leads to bitterness and bitterness to hatred. And that is what consumes you. And that's what makes you sick. That is the breeding ground for disease, is that kind of seedbed of unforgiveness. You know, I was on uh, the radio just a week ago, and a very dear friend of mine, by the name of Vainant, he said to me, we were talking about this very subject, and he said to me, you know, somebody told him that when you get stabbed in the back, that's not the pain. The pain is when you turn around and you see who stabbed you. That is the pain. Because you see, the only person that can get close enough to stab you in the back is someone that you trust. Okay? You're not going to let a stranger come near you with that knife. It's probably a family member. Maybe even your spouse. Maybe your child. And that is the hardest thing to deal with. That unforgiveness. And we need to understand that. And by the way, the, the Lord Jesus Christ himself, he knows. He was sold for 30 pieces of silver to the high priest in Jerusalem by one of his faithful disciples. Remember, 120 disciples started out. And then, they were, then he was left with 12. And of the 12, Judas Iscariot betrayed him. And yet, do you know what Jesus did? He washed the feet of Judas Iscariot before he went to betray him. Now, folks, is that not forgiveness? That is the ultimate example of true love and forgiveness. Now, Jesus says that no servant is above his master. So if a master did it, how much more are you and I to do that? But we must also remember, there's always consequences for our action. What does that mean? Well, when you forgive, okay, you forgive the person, but the, the thing that that person did, he has to deal with himself. I'll give you an example. Just the other day, one of my spiritual sons, who I mentor, phoned me up. He was very distressed on the phone. He said that he has um, a friend... Well, I don't know if we can call him a friend. He says he's a brother in Christ who has got a piece of ground, okay, he's leasing a farm in another county. And this son of mine gave him a hundred head of cattle. Okay, it was a lease. Okay, that's what we do as farmers. We lease out our animals. A hundred head. After a year, he didn't hear anything from this man. And so he tried to phone him. He couldn't get him on the phone. He tried to write an email. No response. Eventually, he contacted somebody up there only to find out that this man had sold the hundred head of cattle and pocketed the money. He hadn't sent the money to the son of mine. Now, he's phoned me and he's very distraught on the phone. What must I do? Must I forgive him? I said, yes, you must forgive him because God says we must forgive one another so that he can forgive us. And then do I just write it off? I said, no, you don't write it off. What that man has done is nothing less than theft. He's a thief. He has stolen your cattle and he's pocketed the money. Justice must take place. You must get hold of him. He says, I can't get hold of him. I said, get in your motor car and drive to that town and visit him with a witness and give him a letter and tell him I'm going to give you one month to replace the money. Otherwise, I'm going to report you to the police. 
and you will be arrested and you will be put in jail for fraud or for theft. So what are we saying? We say we forgive the man, okay, for what he's done, but he has to rectify his mistake. Because if he doesn't rectify his mistake, he is a thief. So we must understand one thing, because I, I know there's somebody sitting there and saying, how can, I, how can I forgive that person for what they did to me? There's been no remorse, there's been no repentance, and they're just carrying on. The justice must be executed, but you must forgive that man. For whose sake? For his sake? No. For your sake. You see, that's, that's the problem here. You think it's for his sake. No, it's not for his sake. It's actually for your sake. And that's why Jesus says, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us. How can you ask Jesus to forgive you of your sins and me of my sins when we will not forgive others. It's very simple. It doesn't work like that. We've got to forgive so God can forgive us. But whatever that person's done, they've got to deal with it themselves. You see, when you get moved with gratitude, okay, that makes it very easy for you to forgive others. You see, the Bible says in Romans chapter 3 and verse 23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All, that's you and me, okay? But the Bible also says in Romans chapter 6 and verse 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Right, so we've all sinned, every single one of us. And the one who says, I haven't, you're the biggest sinner of all because you're a liar as well. We, are, we have been born that way. But we must learn to forgive for whose sake? For our sake. Not for God's sake. He doesn't need anything. It's for you and me so that we can live a life full of abundance. You see, John 10.10, 10, the Lord says, the devil, okay, the thief, he comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Right? But Jesus said, I came to give you abundant life. So today, we are actually speaking about abundant life. Now, abundant life comes when you are obedient to the Word of God. And if the Word of God states clearly, you must forgive, then you have to do it. It's as simple as that. Now, I want to tell you a story, and maybe some of you have heard this story, because it's one of my favorite stories, because it was a defining moment in my life as a new Christian. You see, before I became a Christian, I was a self-made man. I started with nothing. My dad was a blacksmith. He gave us a good education and a good upbringing. That's all he could afford. And that's all we need anyway. And so I started. My, my dream was to be a farmer. I wanted to be self-employed. And I worked hard and I tried everything I could to do that. And I managed to get a farm in Central Africa. But before I was 30 years old, I took my wife and my children and all my worldly possessions and I put them into a truck and a trailer and I drove from Central Africa right down to Southern Africa. When I entered South Africa and I went across the Lumpopo River into South Africa, this truck was an enclosed truck. We'd just come through a war zone. Zimbabwe was at war with Zambia. It was quite a hectic uh, time that we lived in. The customs officer asked me, do you have anything to declare? I said nothing, which was a lie. See, it was a lie. I said, I have nothing to declare. And so he said, carry on. A few years later, 1979, I gave my life to Christ. My life was transformed. You see, before that, I couldn't even sleep at night. That's right. I was so full of all kinds of accusations and probably a lot of unforgiveness and a lot of anger. I left a beautiful farm in Central Africa, 3,500 acres, all paid for, and I left a whole lot. So there was a lot of issues in my life I hadn't dealt with. But when I became a believer, things changed. I started sleeping well at night. I started preaching the gospel myself after only knowing the Lord for three months. That's right. 
But folks, what I want to tell you is very important. After a while, the devil, you see, he's the accuser of the brethren. He's the accuser of the brethren. Not the accuser of the world. No, 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 no. He doesn't accuse the world because he's got the world. See? But he wants us back in the world. So he's the accuser. He's the chief of all liars. He's a thief. And he wants to kill us with his lies. So he started to speak to me in my heart and say, you are a hypocrite. You are standing up there in the pulpit telling other people about Jesus and you are a smuggler. Now, <laughs> it might sound laughable now, but it wasn't at the time. You brought equipment and possessions into this country without declaring them at the border. And you are a thief. See? And this thing started to eat at me. It was that cancer that we're talking about. It was that rust that was starting to devour me. And it was starting to break me down. And I was starting to lose the joy of the Lord, which is your strength. And maybe some of you listening to this program are right there at this very moment. I love Jesus, but I, I, there's things I've done in my life, and um, I just don't know how to deal with them. Okay, well, I want to tell you something now. This is the way you do it. You confess it. See, the Bible says clearly in James chapter 5, verse 16, Confess your sins to one another so that you may be healed. Healed. Some of us are sick in our bodies because of unconfessed sin and unforgiveness. And so the one day I, I got beyond myself, I was losing my joy, I was slipping back into the old ways of worrying, and the devil was saying one day the customs department's going to arrive on the farm and they're going to arrest you because you're going to get found out and all that rubbish. But it's a reality at the time. See, It's like some of us that have done things that we're not proud of and you open the door every morning and you look out to see whether the policeman's arrived or not. That's right, it's a reality. It's best to deal with it and then you sleep well at night. Well, the one day I said to Jill at breakfast time, my children were all very small. I said, I can't carry on like this. I said, I'm going down to Peter Marisburg, which is the city near, near us. I'm going to the chief customs officer. And I'm going to take a list of all the things that I brought into this country that I did not declare. And I'm going to say I'm sorry. Okay? And I'm going to ask him to forgive me. And if I have to go to jail, then I'll go to jail. But I cannot carry on like this. It's killing me. You know that this story I'm telling you is so real, it seems like it happened last week. And it happened 42 years ago. Right? That's right. That's how long it hung on to me. The devil had his tentacles into me. And he was holding on to me. Jesus says, deal with it and move on. And so Jill was obviously very worried. A young lady here, she wasn't even 30 years old. Our oldest child was only seven years old. And she was by herself here. She couldn't speak Zulu in those days. We didn't have many friends here. We'd only just arrived for a, a year or so. We'd built that little daub, wattle and daub house. I said, I'm going down tomorrow morning. And she said, we are going to fast and we're going to pray for you. Now that touched me deeply. I got in that pickup. I'll never forget it as long as I live. And I drove down to Peter Marisburg, which is about 65 kilometers away. Well, I want to tell you, that was probably the longest trip of my life. And as I was driving down, I had a full-on battle with the devil. Oh, yes, I know him very well. And the devil was saying, you are a fool. Just go back and forget about it. Because they're going to arrest you and they're going to put you in jail. And the, devil, and the Lord said, Angus, just confess your sins. And I will help you. Now, I've got a choice. Who am I going to believe you? The devil or the Lord? You've got the same choice. As I'm talking to you now, the devil is saying to you, don't forgive him. He doesn't deserve it. The devil is saying to you, don't forgive that partner who did you down. Leave him. Let him rot. Don't forgive him. The Lord says, for your own sake, forgive him so that I can forgive you. That's what happened. So now we got, we got into Peter Marisburg. I'll never forget it. I got there about lunchtime, about one o'clock. 
There's a huge, big old colonial building there with big white pillars. Very daunting, very intimidating. I parked my pickup there and I walked up those steps. Right up to the top, I went down the passage to the immigration office. It's the government office. I looked in through the door and the crack of the door and there was no one at the front counter. I'll never forget it. And I thought to myself, and the devil encouraged me, don't worry, there's nobody there, just, just go back home. And I was about to turn around, this is the honest truth, and go back. I'm so pleased I didn't. And I heard a voice coming from the back. You see, when God does something, He does it properly. Deep voice, a senior man, can I help you, young man? And I looked in there, and there was the chief customs officer. This man had so much brass on his shoulders, his shoulders were sagging. He had a white beard and he was very, very authoritative. Okay? Can I help you? And I walked in, and I, I mean, I was on the, on the spot now. And I said, yes, sir, I, I, I'd like to um, ask you a question. He said, yes, that's right. Go ahead. That's why I'm here. It's lunchtime, but I'd love to help you. So sit down. I've got time. I said, sir, I want to tell you that, you know, I used to be an unbeliever and I gave my, I gave my life to Jesus. He said, son, this is a customs office. <laughs> he said, this is not a church. <laughs> I said, no, no, please just be patient with me. And this man had a change in his life. And then I stopped and I said, this man is actually me. He said, well, what is it? I said, I came down from Central Africa a couple of years ago. And I brought a lot of stuff into this country, which I did not declare. And I've come here today to own up and to pay whatever I owe the, the, the government. So he looked at me and he said, okay, he got an A4 pad out. I'll never forget. He got a pen. And he said, carry on. Let me tell you. What, tell me, what did you bring into the country? Then I started. I must say his eyebrows did rise. I had 11 tons net on that truck. I said, I brought in a tractor. He said, a what? I said, a tractor. I broke it down into pieces and I brought it in. A tractor, right. I brought in a lighting plant. Seven and a half KVA lighting plant. I brought in a welding machine. I brought in a tool kit. I brought in a 250 horse mercury outboard motors, which I intend to sell to get money to start my farming. I bought in a lady's watch, gold watch, and a man's gold watch. That watch was so heavy I could hardly hold it in my arm. I bought everything that I could find to get a new start. And I went right through the list, right through the list. And then I finished. And I just sat there and I, you know, you know, I cannot explain to you how I felt. It was like a burden had fallen off my shoulders. It was like that 50 kg bag of cement I was telling you. I just fell off my shoulders. I'm free. And the devil, I could see it. He left that room immediately. No more shackles, no more ropes holding me back. I've let it all out and now it's over to God. You need to be doing that today. You need to get it off your chest and you need to deal with it and leave it at the foot of the cross. That's why Jesus died. He died for your sins and my sins. And one of the sins is unforgiveness. It's a major sin. Okay, you cannot hold a grudge against someone and expect to have the joy and the fullness of God. Well, he looked at all this and he looked at me and he looked again in the list. He said, that's quite an impressive list, son. <laughs> he said, right, let's go through it. What are you by profession? I said, I'm a farmer. He said, right, well, the tractor is duty free. And what about the lighting plant? That's for my house. That's duty free. And what about the welding machine tools of the trade? That's duty free. And that big tool kit, that big uh, cabinet, that you, that's duty free. And the two outboard motors, well, that's for your pleasure. That's duty free. And the watches, those are your personal possessions. And he went on and on and on and on. And then when he had finished, he said, young man, you don't owe us anything. You are free to go. Well, you know, I even get emotional telling you the story after 42 years. You know, I walked out that office, folks. I didn't walk down those steps. I flew down those steps like an eagle. I walked down the, the pavement. I got into my pickup. I, I, I was so light. I was so happy. I was crying. I was laughing. Lord, it's done. It's finished. Over. 
The devil was holding me by a lie. That was how he was holding me, by an absolute lie. And if I had not confessed it, it would have killed me. I'll never forget coming up to the first robot. I stopped there and somebody came and parked next to me. I was so happy. I ran down my window. I said, good day. How are you? They looked at me. They must have thought I'd come out of an asylum. I was like Crocodile Dundee. You remember that movie where he greeted everybody? And people thought he was mad because that's what we do in the country. But I want to tell you I was free. Now, that unforgiveness that I'm talking about has been holding you. For some of you for years, I remember an old lady used to call me to her house. She lived in Great Town. She was 100 years old. And she, there's something happened in her family with a daughter of hers who had been terribly, terribly hurt. And that lady eventually took her life. And the mother could never forgive the man that caused that hurt. And I had to say to her one day, you have to forgive. But I can't. I said, you can and you must. And we were able to pray together. And she was able to confess it aloud, name the person who had caused that pain and forced her daughter to take her life. And you know something? From that day onwards, that woman was free, absolutely free. She changed in an instant. That is what forgiveness does. It sets you free. Forgive us our sins. Forgive us our debts as we forget, forgive our debtors. That's what the Lord's Prayer says. Now, you know, there's a little man in the Bible. His name is Zacchaeus. He was a short little man. He heard that Jesus was coming to town. So he climbed up a sycamore tree. A sycamore tree is a wild fig tree, by the way. And as he heard Jesus coming to town, he was listening and watching out for him. Everybody was shouting and, and welcoming him. He was a hero. Jesus was a miracle worker. The only man that's ever walked on water. The only man that ever will walk on water. I'm talking about a mortal man. That is Jesus. The one who fed 5,000 men with two little fishes and five barley loaves. The man who called Lazarus out of the tomb after being dead for four days. I'm talking about a miracle worker. The crowd was following him. And this little man, he was a chief tax collector. A chief thief, actually. Stealing, not from the Romans, from his own people. He was hated by the locals. And he climbed up this tree to see this Jesus coming down the road. And what happened when Jesus came into town and he looked up and he saw Zacchaeus in that tree. He said, Zacchaeus, come down. Today I'm coming to have lunch at your house. Now can you imagine what that did to the crowd? First of all, who told Jesus his name was Zacchaeus? The same thing that he said to Nathaniel. Nathaniel, you are a man in whose mouth is no guile. And he said, who told you that? Well, he knew it, you see, because he's God. Come down from the tree, Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus came down from the tree. Jesus went in to have lunch with him. Even the disciples said, how can the Lord go in there with those bunch of thieves? And Zacchaeus called all his friends. All the tax collectors were there. And they had, they had lunch together. And you know, Zacchaeus stood up and he said to the Lord, he confessed, okay, and he forgave. He said, Lord, if I have taken anything from anyone, I will repay them. And I will repay them four times the amount that I've taken. That's 400%. Some of us watching this program are reluctant to give God 10%, which belongs to him anyway, by the way, of a tithe. 400%. And what was Jesus' answer? You can read it in Luke chapter 19 and verse 9. Jesus said, salvation has come to this house today. Folks, I want to tell you something now. Faith has got feet. Can you see my cowboy boots? Faith has got feet. Faith is a doing word. Faith is not just talking. Forgive that person. Write the letter after this program. Make the phone call. Come before the Lord and deal with it. And I'm telling you, your life will be completely changed in an instant. In fact, some of you might even be physically healed because that thorn that's been in your, in, your, in, your, in your foot has now been taken out and you can run freely. We need to forgive. 
You know, the main reason why I'm telling you this story is because God speaks to me through events that happen in my life. That's where I meet Jesus. I meet Jesus every single day. I don't meet him, meet him at Bible college. I don't meet him at Bible study. I don't meet him in the church service on Sundays only. I meet him in every day affair. Last week in my office, we got a letter written by a man who was very, very upset. And he asked if it is possible if he could speak to me personally on the phone. Of course, I responded, you can, you are welcome. I came up to the office the one day and my secretary came in with a cell phone. She said, this gentleman is on the phone. And I, she pressed the speaker phone, um, digit and we could hear clearly what he was saying. And this is the story. And it goes like this, and it's a true story. This man said to me, I could hear he was very troubled. He said, Angus, you don't know me. He said, but in 2007, 14 years ago today, he said, I hated you. I said, really? He said, I hated you because I was jealous of you. I was bitter. And I was angry and it was getting worse. I said, why? He said, because I used to stand outside our church in Great Town. Now, I don't know what church it is. I'm not pointing fingers at anybody. I'm telling you a story. I used to stand outside our church with a lot of our people. And we used to watch the multitude of cars driving down the road past our church coming to the farm, Shalom, to a mighty men conference. Thousands of cars. And I hated you because I was jealous of you and I was bitter. He said, and eventually it got so bad. I'm talking 14 years. It got so bad that my family started to disintegrate. He said, I decided to leave town. And I told my wife and children, we are leaving town. His wife said, well, I'm not leaving. He divorced her. You know, this took a lot out of me as well, listening to this man. By this time, he's weeping. And I went to another city. And I tried to start all over again. He says, I've since got remarried. He said, but there's something that is troubling me so much. And that is that I have never asked forgiveness of you for what was in my heart. I said to him, I forgive you. I'll call him John. I forgive you, John. I said, John, the thing is, I never even knew that you had anything against me because I don't know you. But I forgive you. And I prayed for him on the phone, a heartfelt prayer. And I believe that that bag of cement fell off his back and the shackles were taken off his ankles because he was free. And I could hear the different voice on the phone. Joy, relief, forgiveness. And he said to me, I said to him, we spoke to each other. I said, will you come past this way? Next time, come and have a cup of tea with me. I'd love to have a chat with you. And he was weeping uncontrollably when he said goodbye. You see, folks, what you've got to understand about unforgiveness is, I was not suffering because he hated me. I didn't know that he hated me. I was carrying on with my life. He was the one that was suffering. Now, if you've got unforgiveness because of an unfaithful husband who left you for another woman, he's carrying on with his life. And you are so bitter. You're so angry. You're so disappointed. It's killing you. And you can't move on. Now, today, you're going to lay that thing down at the altar and you're going to start a new life. That son, that daughter that's disappointed you so badly, you are going to forgive them and you're going to love them and you're going to carry on with your life because that's the only way you can do it. Because Jesus said, forgive us our debts as we forgive them that have debts against us. Forgive us our trespasses, Lord, as we forgive those who trespass against us. He taught us that prayer. He forgave Judas. He washed his feet. And he knew what Judas was going to do. By the way, there were some other dirty feet as well. He forgave Peter who had denied him three times. 
washed his feet. Peter hadn't done it yet, but he knew what was coming. He forgave Thomas. Thomas said, I'll believe it when I see it. He was a doubter. God washed his feet too. We need to do it. We need to forgive. Now I'm coming to the conclusion of this message. And this is a very serious message for me because it changed my life. And it can change your life as well. Deal with this thing so that you might have true freedom and absolute peace. Now remember, very easy to forgive somebody something when that person doesn't mean anything to you. See? But when it's somebody that's so close, lives under the same roof that you live under, you've fed that person, you've clothed them, you've educated them, you've set them up maybe in a business, and they have basically just disregarded it completely. And it's so hurtful. Forgive them so that you can move on. So we are now going to pray. So maybe, I don't know where you're sitting. Maybe you're sitting in a room. Maybe the very person that uh, you have not forgiven is sitting next to you. I don't know. That would be our optimum time to ask for forgiveness. Maybe it's a phone call, a letter that you just need to write. Maybe you just need to go into your closet because maybe that person's not even alive anymore. And you need to say, Lord, I give that situation to you. Cast your burdens unto Jesus because he cares for you. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7. Just give Jesus that burden. That's right. Those are the things that hurt. Remember? It's not the knife in the back. It's the one that put it there that causes the pain. So we're going to pray. And you're going to pray after me. And then we're going to put this thing to rest. Remember how I felt when I came out of that customs office when I confessed my sin? And this is one of the greatest sins of all. The sin of unforgiveness. Heavenly Father, just pray after me. I choose today. I don't feel like it. I don't actually even want to do it, Lord, because I'm so angry. I'm so disappointed. I'm hurting so much. My life has been ruined because of that person. But today, Lord Jesus, I forgive that person. Name her. Name him, name that company, name that people group, whatever it might be. Name them today. Lord, I choose to forgive them. I take that burden, Lord. I put it at the foot of the cross and I speak no more about it because it is done. Thank you for the blood that you shed on the cross of Calvary, which washes away every one of those sins. Take those memories out of my mind and give me new life in Jesus' name. Amen. May the Lord Jesus Christ bless you as you continue by faith to walk in the power of God. Until next time on the Revival Train, may God bless you and keep you strong. Goodbye. Thank you for joining us on the Revival Train. Download the free Angus Buchan app to stay updated, watch your favorite programs, and enjoy daily devotionals. For more information on the Revival Train and Shalom Ministries, please go to www.angusbucken.co.za.